things pop up and inevitably we get it wrong. <laughs> Early Christians had a challenge on their hands, trying to make sense of a God who had just become incarnate. They knew that there was only one God. It was the person of Jesus Christ and then the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. God was suddenly becoming a lot more complex. The theology of the Trinity is Christianity's way to make sense of God, or at least try to. The theology of the Trinity is just one more stab of finite humans trying to understand the infinite. One of the classic ways to understand God is through metaphor. Using words that are like God, so we have a sense of God. And the Bible does this all the time. For instance, some of the metaphors and names used to describe God in Scripture include an anchor, a binder of wounds, creator, fountain, liberator, light, love, just to name a very few. This is not to say that God is literally an anchor or a fountain, but that these are metaphors, words to help us understand God. In the same way, the Trinity is a way of describing God. It is metaphorical. God is not literally a father, a son, and a dove, but the relations inherent in this understanding are as close to the reality as we can get. I don't know if any of you have ever read the book, The Shack by William Young. I highly recommend it if you have not done so. God the Trinity is one of the characters. And when the protagonist of the novel, the protagonist Mac, first meets God at the shack, he sees three people, the earthy black woman, a middle-aged Jewish man, 
an ethereal Asian woman. He knows he's supposed to meet God, but doesn't know who they are and asks, well, which one of you is God? I am, said all three in unison. Later, when he's talking to the motherly black woman, who's actually God the Father, and Mac expresses confusion at her gender, she says to him, Mackenzie, I'm neither male nor female even though both genders are derived from my nature. If I choose to appear to you as a man or a woman, it's because I love you. For me to appear to you as a woman and suggest that you call me Papa is simply to mix metaphors, to help keep you from falling so easily back into your religious condition. That's actually helpful advice for all of us. None of us should get too comfortable with only one image of God. Toward the end of the book, as Matt becomes reconciled to his own father, he again gets together with Papa, only this time he's not a large black woman, but changed into an older, wiry white man with a ponytail, mustache, and goatee, plaid shirt with sleeves rolled up, jeans and hiking boots completely outfit. Papa? Asks, yes, son. Back shook his head. You're still messing with me, aren't you? Always, God said with a smile. End quote. One of the great strengths of this book is the fluid portrayal of God. That God is bigger than any one image or metaphor can fully encapsulate. In fact, scripture itself uses female metaphors for God. A couple of examples include Hosea, where God speaks to Israel and says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks, and I bent down to them and fed them. In other words, God is describing herself as a nursing mother. In Isaiah, God says, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. The composer, Brian Wren, often uses male and female images of God in his songs. And in his book, What Language Shall I Borrow? Wren says, quote, even if I pile metaphor on metaphor, and call God rock, water, fire, father, sister, midwife, friend. What I am describing is God's impact on us and qualities of relationship we can experience with the divine. To say that God literally is our mother or father or friend, or to claim that God must be thought of and addressed in no other way, would be to misunderstand how metaphors and similes work. If it meant anything, it would mean we were making metaphors into idols. So I invite you to pay close attention to our final hymn today. It was written by Brian Wren, and it has some wonderful imagery of God in it. So in other words, it's perfectly all right to use the pronoun she to refer to God. This is because it is a metaphor. We do not literally believe God to be a woman. Nor do we literally believe God to be a man. God is beyond gender. Gender is a human limitation. That is one reason that to on today's cover, the bulletin cover, you may notice, has three women as the trinity. Let's mix it up. <clears throat> so the problem is not gender. The problem is language. Our language, any human language, is insufficient to describe the majesty of God. In addition, our limited brains can't fathom the infinite. We are stuck with metaphor and simile. It gives us something to hang our hat on. Both male 
and female imagery for God are useful, but this does not mean that God is male or female. Describing the first person of the Trinity as father is one of the better ways to understand that person. Envisioning the third person of the Trinity as a dove is also a helpful metaphor. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, remains as Jesus, the one who revealed himself to us as a man. At the same time, we can just as easily speak of mother, son, and holy flame, or divine parent, only begotten, Holy Spirit. And if you are not comfortable with using the word she when referring to God, then don't. You can refer to God as man and father and he for the rest of your life and be perfectly theologically acceptable. However, to get the fullest understanding of the Almighty, use as many metaphors as possible. Male and female, young and old, doors and shepherds and songs. I sometimes refer to God as she and sometimes as he. Both are correct. Both are insufficient. Yet it's all we have to work with. So let's make the most of the language that we do have and use the fullness of its breadth and depth to help describe our infinite and glorious God. Praise to the holy and undivided Trinity, one God, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. congregation stand and able as we declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Right, you feel those prayers. The prayers of the people. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That you may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your Lord and sacraments. Bless the victims and their families for all mass shootings. Strengthen our resolve to counter the sin. Of racism, eliminate the proliferation of assault weapons, and address the crises of loneliness and mental illness in our nation. We also lift up to the people of Ukraine and Russia that peace may be restored. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on earth. It is grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our words may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. We pray especially for those suffering from COVID, their loved ones, and healthcare professionals. In our parish family, we pray for Amy, Arthur, Debbie Bent. Janet Billow, Bruna, Doris Butler, Lydia Sidrome, Cheryl, Patricia Cotty, Robert Cobell, Dorothy Dub, Penny Elkins, Richard Farrell, David Fieldhouse, Hollowell and Armstrong families, JC, J. 
JD, JW, Jeanette, Jeffrey, Scott Johnson, Julia, Deborah Catloy, LW, Kevin McKenzie, Sandy McGee, Holly Madamore, Kevin McGowan, Michael, Becky Miller, Jim Murphy, Vicki Owen, Joseph Olivieri, Jim O'Reilly, Cheryl Pappas, Lisa Pappas, Will Coleman, John Roblard, Brian Smith, Jamie Sousa and family, Walter Thorpe, Bill and Jan Walsh, Vicki Webweiser and Carl Wickstrom, that they may be delivered from their distress. Jesus, who is present at a wedding in Cana of Galilee, we give thanks for the wedding of Becca Di Natale and Charles Ober yesterday at Emmanuel. Let's have a long and happy lives together. We especially remember Bernard David Hutchins, in whose loving memory the altar flowers are given today. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. We also want to share your communion. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Almighty eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. The peace of Christ be always with you. Peace be with you. Please have a seat. Please join us for coffee after the service in the parish hall. And uh, this is our reminder that this is our last service um, of two, last Sunday of two services. We'll now be switching to our summer schedule of just one service at 9 a.m. In addition, we are also beginning our two-week respite period. So, uh, will not be having activities in the church or meetings and worship is even a little bit uh, more modest scale. We do have Chrissy Hoag who will be leading morning prayer next Sunday at 9 a.m. No music, it'll be just a quiet morning prayer service. And then for the following Sunday, the 26th, uh, we will be sending you some links to online worship where you may participate. And then starting in July, we'll back again in person, 9 a.m. every Sunday. So we hope you enjoy a little, little COVID respite. Um, Holly, you'll notice, is not here because she is in Linfield this Sunday. It's Deacon Sunday, so she's at a church who uh, are, don't have a deacon and teaching a little bit about what deacons do. We are so blessed with her ministry and uh, we're grateful that other churches can learn what a gift she is and what, what a gift deacons are to are there other announcements? Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
prophets, sages, and saints in every age to confront our sin and reveal the vision of your new creation. Joining in the song of the universe, we proclaim your glory, singing thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to his friends, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. <clears throat> After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, gave me thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. And now we gather at this table in response to his commandment to share the bread and cup of Christ's undying love and to proclaim our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Breathe your Holy Spirit, the wisdom of the universe, upon these gifts that we bring to you, this bread and this cup, ourselves, our souls and bodies, that we may be signs of your love for all the world and ministers of your transforming purpose. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, O Creator of all, we bless your holy name forever. Amen. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we're bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done.
May God give us the grace to never sell ourselves short. The grace to risk something big for something good. And the grace to remember that the world is now too dangerous for anything but the truth, too small for anything but love. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you and those you love this day. Amen.